awesome. Those that are in the foyer, you guys can come on in. We're going to get started. Hey, Amen. How are we doing tonight? Good? There's a few of us. We brave the snow. Amen. Awesome. Just where you're at, just stand to your feet. Just lift up your hands where you're at. Father, we thank you for tonight. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come together, to freely worship you, to freely lift up clean hands and pure hearts to you tonight. Father, we want to worship you tonight with everything that we are. Father, we want to release an expression of worship to you. Father, we lay down everything. We lay down our distractions. We lay down our pride. We lay down our wants and our desires to put you first tonight. Father, we want to seek you first tonight. We ask that you would break the fallow ground of our heart. Break the hardness, God. Prepare us for tonight. Prepare us for your courtroom to enter into your presence tonight. Jesus, we thank you and we make room. We make room for you to move. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come. Prepare us, God. Prepare us. Shift our hearts right now. Shift the atmosphere, God. Even those that are watching, God, right now, prepare us, God. Prepare the atmosphere. Prepare our mindset that you would move, God. worship you, Father. We honor you and we give you all the praise tonight. If you agree, just lift up a shout. Amen.
lift his name higher and higher. Sing it out, he's in the fire, he's in the fire. In the flames, he's not done working. So don't lose faith, don't you stop praising.
can have it all, all my love, all our love, all our love, yes you can have it all. It's all about the affections on Jesus. It's the affection of his voice. It's the affection and the pour out of how good he is and how worthy he is. And so during this time and this transition of fasting and all that good stuff, remind yourself that where is my heart set on? Who is my heart set on? Amen. And I believe that during this time, I can feel it even in the room where some people, your bodies are like, what's going on? But set your gaze and your affections on the one we love. Amen. And during that, I can just tell like this is gonna be a great fast because we were filling in ourselves. We're like, wow, we're we're getting hit, but in a great way. But set your affections on Him. Amen. Amen. So Lord, we just lift up every hand raised. Lord, we just set our gaze and our affections before you, Father. There is none like you. There is none beside you, Lord. And even during this time that we set apart corporately, Lord, privately, Lord, show us what it is you desire from us. Show us what it is, Lord, that we need to lay down even more of, Father. We set our eyes on you. We set our affections on you, Father. So give us, Lord, just a strength and a courage, Lord, even during this time, Lord, to set our face upon on you to set our eyes on you Jesus we just bless you and we honor you in Jesus mighty name amen hallelujah for whatever reason God took me to uh, the book of Jeremiah anybody feel like they're in Babylon sometimes like, what happened to Jerusalem? How in the heck did we get to Babylon? Like, everything's just crazy. And so Jeremiah writes, and this is after uh, they had been taken from Jerusalem. Taken. They didn't choose. Taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. And God said that he would finish what he started in Babylon. He says, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place, to Jerusalem, this place of wonders, a great place of love, this place with him. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. And that's encouraging. But we forget what he said in the scriptures before that, which is, while you're in Babylon, make peace in Babylon. Speak peace to Babylon. And I'm challenged because I I don't want to speak peace to the world that's killing me. I don't want to speak peace to the co-workers that are berating me. I don't want to speak peace to the mandates that I want to punch in the face. I don't want to speak peace to these things. But the Lord says you need to speak peace so that there will be peace where you are at, even in the midst of Babylon. 
So yeah, we want, we want to seek him and find him, but we don't want to speak, speak peace. We just want to seek him and find him, but we've got to speak peace. So I want to encourage us tonight, especially going into this fast. It's not making peace with the world because the world doesn't want to be at peace with us. It's speaking peace to the Babylon that we are in. As we go through this fast, it's speaking peace in the midst of criticism. Why in the heck aren't you eating? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Amen? Ruth, come on up here. Ruth got a word earlier today, which, by the way, it's hard to get a word if you're not seeking God. That's just a side note. Ruth got a word today. I would, I would assume she wasn't just twiddling her thumbs, but seeking God. Amen? And it's a very, very good word. to say tonight to all of us and this came to me um, the people on the sidelines are coming out to the field in power and glory they will shine the, the quarterbacks speaking of spiritual quarterbacks will are being anointed for the end times to come forth as lights to shine in these last days and times that we're in. God needs all of us to say, stay on the field. The spiritual quarterbacks are the strong and forceful and focused on uh, fighting <laughs> fighting against the darkness and kingdom and authority means fight mindset not coming not giving up till we make a touchdown and what I got I was so excited about this because I know this is the year we are going to make a touchdown as the body of Christ in this church. And there's not going to be anyone to stop us making that touchdown because we're going to run with the power and glory of the Holy Spirit. And so that, how many, how many of you, I didn't know I was going to put this in too, but <laughs> how many of you want to be a spiritual quarterback in this season, in this, this time we're in? <laughs> My hand's up too, man. I'm going to be a spiritual quarterback. We're going to go after the darkness that's trying to destroy this world, destroy the, just bringing all the havoc he can bring in here. And he's the loser, and we're the winners. And we're going to make a touchdown, right? So, Father God, I just pray for this congregation now, and I pray for all of us that want to be a spiritual quarterback. And Lord, we're just going to go after the darkness, and we're not going to give up until we can make a touchdown. And we're going to make more than one touchdown. We're going to touch down on his kingdom with authority, power, and glory, and we're going to win in Jesus' name. You mind if I tag on to that? You mind if I tag on? You're good. Oh, no, I'm just going to tag on to it. Cool? No, because when she read it, she, she has no clue what Pastor Epps is preaching about tonight. No idea. But when she read that first line about there's people on the sidelines that are going to get into the game, just wait till you hear the message tonight. But here's the deal. Not everybody can be a quarterback, right? Not everybody needs to be, but everybody needs to be in the game. Amen? Everybody needs to be in the game. Amen. And your field may be different than my field, and you may be get, get to be the quarterback in the field that you're on. I may get to be the quarterback in the field that I'm, but we all need to play in the stinking game. And, and as she said, the word she got from God is that everybody this year, everybody that's been on the sidelines, say this, say, sometimes I stand on the sidelines. But this year, I'm getting in the game. Amen. 
You don't have to wait for the coach to put you in. God ordained you to play. And it's time to get in the game. And man, I think there's some like Disney song about getting in the game, but I'm not gonna try to sing it. Anyways, amen. Is there, is there, there's gotta be a song. Anyways, we're not going there, all right. Ruth, thank you for getting in the presence of God. Thank you. That's a very good word. And it, even if there's just one person tonight that's like, man, I feel like I never get to play. I feel like I never, get in the game. Wherever you are, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be with an instrument. It doesn't have to be with, with the title of pastor. It doesn't have to be those things. It can be the guy that cleans up the garbage for everybody on my street needs to get in the game. Why? Because he sees everybody on my street get in the game. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praise tonight. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Before you uh, sit down, we're going to transition, but before you do, greet somebody tonight. They don't need to be new. They're just new to you today because you haven't seen them today, so greet somebody today. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you all for braving the weather. More importantly, braving the yahoos driving on the road. Amen. I don't know how many cars I saw staring at me in the same lane I was in. It was fun. It was a trip getting here. Amen. But we just thank you for being here in person or for watching online. If you couldn't make it in, we do understand completely. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand. The ushers would be happy to get those to you. Jonathan, we need you to do a dance for us sometime soon again. I, I haven't forgotten. You and Oli. Hey, hey. Yeah, on blast. Raise your hand if you need an offering envelope. Amen. You're here, which means you should probably tithe. Hallelujah. All right. How many people are excited about 2022? I mean, you should be, you're alive. That's like a good start. It's a really quality start. Well, while you're filling out your offering envelopes, I'm just gonna give you a couple of the announcements of things we have coming up soon. I'm gonna leave the other 37 off. You can hear them on Sunday. But you need to, uh, you need to go to the Church Center app and check out all of our announcements. Amen. Zany is tightening up the ship. How many people appreciate Zany? Well, I don't know where she just went, but give it up for Zany. Amen, yeah. Yeah. Tightening the ship. That is a good thing. Amen. Just getting everything in line, right? Everything you think should be happening, it takes somebody doing it, right? Amen. So I, I'm appreciative of what she's doing, getting things together. Amen. Let's pray real quick, and then I'll do the announcements. Father God, I thank you. God, that you brought us all here safely. God, that we can be gathered as one body, physically, spiritually, emotionally, Father, together with you. And I just thank you for that, God. I thank you for a, uh, a room with, uh, with heat and a roof. And Father, may we not take that for granted. So God, we just thank you for that. We thank you for all the increase. Father, we pray a blessing over the, the hands that sow to this ministry and a blessing over the offering tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Seekers, those that are three to five years old, you guys will be in the nursery tonight. So parents of the three to five-year-olds, take them to the nursery tonight. There will be no class upstairs for them. Amen. And this Sunday, we have a parent meeting in the cafe as well as uh, the hospitality, the greeters team. You'll be meeting as well directly after service. Uh, if you're in both of those, it'll be organized 
better than it sounds like it's coming out of my mouth. Amen? Hospitality team and parents of kids in our children's program, uh, you both have uh, meetings this Sunday directly after service. Amen. And like I said, go to uh, the Church Center app. We've got stuff on the weekend, the 21st through the 23rd. We've got like three events. The following weekend, we have a, a, a burn night on the 28th. So you need to go there and get everything so you can lay your calendar out appropriately. There has never been a greater time, and we're getting ready to bring Pastor Ab up, there's never been a greater time that we have needed to plan to be together. Amen? That we've needed to plan to spend time together. And I'm talking to myself, you're like, Jason, you weren't at this, and I know. I know, I need to do better at planning ahead of time. Why? Because there's a million things to do. How many people have a million things to do every day? And then they have kids. You have kids who have a million things to do on top of the million things to do that you have to do, and you have to do those things because they're your kids. Amen. We need to plan to be together in 2022. Amen. So check out the Church Center app so you can plan ahead for the things that we have going on. Kiddos, get out of here. All the kids are getting out. Three to five-year-olds back there. Youth, get on out of here. Amen. I would encourage you to move forward tonight. Amen. Amen. Usually he brushes his teeth. I'm pretty sure he did tonight. I'm pretty sure his breath smells good. I don't know. I didn't get that close. But I would encourage you to, uh, to move forward. Nobody ever does. It's the, it's the best thing to ask people to do because they just look at you like you're crazy. I, am, I can do what I want. I'm an adult. Amen. Amen. Sometimes the, the Holy Spirit spit from the pastor is all you need. If you're too far away, you can't get it. Amen. So... All right, I'm ready for a good word. I have an inside scoop of what he's preaching on. I'm encouraged for you to receive this tonight. So let's welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Ed Pena. Amen. Good to see everybody in the house of God. As Jason put it, you guys braved the weather. So it's good to see y'all here. Amen. How many brought your physical Bibles? Physical Bibles, I want to see them. Stick them up, stick them up. There it is. If you haven't been with us, we're focusing on eliminating these right here for note-taking and reading the Bible while we're in church. And we've encouraged you guys to break out the Bible, you know, take the dust off of it first, right? Some of it's been on the shelf for a long, long time. We've been using technology to read the Bible. So um, we're going we're gonna to dig in tonight. I'm not going to, I'm going to go right into it. But before we go into it, um, a quick announcement. If you have seen the post on Facebook, we went on Facebook and we created a um, media content there to show you the dates that we begin fasting. It's going to be the 10th of January, which will be this coming Monday. We're going to fast from the 10th to the 30th, 21 days. Did you all see that? If you did not see it, if you're online streaming, just go on Facebook, The Rock Columbus Facebook, and you'll see it on there. We also included, um, just for some brief referencing, education, you're going to look at the types of fast that you can actually do. And I'm going to echo what Zany said. This is not a beginning of the year diet plan. This is something that we know that the heavens respond to when we do things like this, so and I mentioned it this way, I said, you can, you can pray without fasting, but you can't fast without praying. So it is a time of separation, not just fasting food. It's a time where you fast and you pray and you seek God. That process crucifies the flesh. And I'm not going to pretend to understand how it works, but in the physical or in the spiritual realm, it begins to fine tune you to the spirit realm. You see things clearer. You go into prayer with more authority. Amen. How many believe that we need to walk in authority in today's time? More than ever. More than ever. So don't forget that um, beginning on Monday. And we'll, we'll make another, another announcement on Sunday. But bow your heads with me. I want to pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we... We not only ask for your manifestation, God, for your presence, but God, we are dependent upon it. There's nothing that we can do in our own flesh 
For your word says that we can do nothing without you. Nothing without you. You chose to wrap yourself, God, in, in a human being called Jesus. You chose to make us, God, in the garden, in your image, in your likeness. You chose mankind. And so here we are, Father, and we say, speak tonight. Use this vessel. Less of me and more of you. Come against every heaviness in spirit. God, I come against every lie of the enemy, every spirit of hopelessness, every spirit of discouragement. We bind you now. We make you subject under the realm of the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. And God, for those that are listening online, I just pray that your presence visit them there as well, Father. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. And tonight, God, let those that hear be liberated. In the name of Jesus in the church said, amen. Amen. I want to wanna start off by being a little bit more... Not that I'm not direct with you guys. You guys know I'm pretty straightforward. But um, there are certain sermons that I kind of like to just keep it real, but more, keep it more real than real, okay? So, and this is going to be one of them. Sometimes I, uh, sometimes in my prayer closet, when I'm praying and I'm seeking the Lord and I'm reminded of the sermons that I preach and I look at the world and I begin to discern. The Bible calls us to, to live soberly, being able to discern the times. When I begin to discern the times, it does not take me long to come to the conclusion that unless you live under a rock, that the curtain of humanity is beginning to close. And week after week, Thursday after Thursday, Sunday after Sunday, there's a part of me that is like, how, Father, how do I convey this to the people with such conviction that when they leave the church, there's something that transforms their heart for them to live like they actually believe, not in what I'm saying, but believe in what the word has declared. How can we make that happen? We know the answer is only can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? But if I'm, if I'm being honest with you guys, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, so you, like Jason said, you guys brave the weather. You're here, so I'm not here to beat you up. I want to give you hopefully an encouraging word, amen? But there are many times where I feel like Noah. I feel like Noah. And I, and I feel like Noah in this sense is that no one knew, he had a word from God, he knew that God proposed in his heart to wipe everything out, to come and to destroy. You don't need to get too far in the Bible. You get into six chapters and you find out the judgment of God. Only six chapters, and there's 66 books in the Bible. You only need to read into only six chapters to find out that God deals with unrighteousness by judging, and he proposed in his heart to wipe out the entire earth. Now, that is a global destruction. You know how they say the asteroids wiped out the dinosaurs? I believe it was the flood. <laughs> but how do I convey that? And, and so Noah knew what was coming. He preached the same message. For almost a century, nobody believed. Nobody believed. And I thought to myself that, you know, if you look at, if you study Scripture historically, and I mentioned this before, about 2,000 years, probably, we don't know how long uh, from the creation of Adam to the fall of Adam, how long that was. We know that from the creation of Adam to the destruction of the world through water was about 2,000 years. 
And in those days, men lived about 100 years. So the population exploded. There was, it wasn't just Noah and a group of pe people in the city that he lived. According to archaeology, civilization had thrived and had occupied the four corners of the world. Okay? And so he preached. They saw the ark going up. And here's the thing that I want to draw attention to tonight. If you read in the scriptures, there was hardly anyone that not only believed in Noah, but hardly anyone helped him. That's why it took 100 years. And so that, that part of frustration that he had is the same frustration that has carried over it until, until this day. And that is the frustration of the shortage of workers in the kingdom. Can I get an amen? I was talking to my, um, my uh, nephew, Caleb, works at Amazon. Anybody here work at Amazon just out of curiosity? No? You did? So he said, because the beginning of the year, they reset the time. So a lot, of a lot of the workers there get time off at the beginning of the year. So he went to work today, and he says it was weird because as soon as I walk in, there was hardly anybody working. He said, Uncle, it was strange, super silent. There was hardly any. I'm like, how do you guys get any work done? How do, we, how do I get the packages? A lot of it is now becoming robotic, right? They're incorporating a lot of robots. But at the very beginning of the year, everybody's already putting in time, and there was nobody that, that was working. So I wanted to bring a message um, <clears throat> tonight that's going to be kind of propelling us into 2022 because how many know we need workers in the church? We need volunteers, right? We need workers. So I want to I want to show some things uh, to you guys here tonight that hopefully it'll be a guide for how you make decisions regarding putting your hands to the plow of ministry and actually doing something in the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you I'm going to load you up with some scriptures. I want you I want you to take these scriptures down, and when we get done, I want you to go back and actually. Reflect on them, study them, and get them in your spirit. Amen? But I believe that um, as a society, we are facing um, an epidemic in the, in the world, not only in the secular world, but in the, in the church as well. I would sum up that epidemic, if I was to sum it up, I would sum it up in one word, um, and that word is entitlement. I can use a lot of words besides entitlement, but I think entitlement is part of of the problem. And why do I say that is here in the U.S., you guys know me, I'm, I'm from Brazil. I, wasn't, I was born in Brazil until I was eight. I was raised here, but we came here without knowing the language. My dad came with $2 in his pocket. I understand the val value of hard work and delayed gratification. And it wasn't like we see today. It wasn't like that when I was a teenager. So the, the work ethics that my father instilled in me, mind you, not knowing the language, coming from another country, I was able to apply myself, and thankfully, I was able to make a good living until I started preaching. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I made a lot of money. I was very successful. But this mindset of entitlement that you can get things from the government without doing anything has caused a, a deep-rooted issue, and now we're facing literally an epidemic. People don't want to show up to work. And here's, here's the interesting thing. How many have even heard me say, you know, this is, we, we have a volunteer army. A lot of the leaders that we have, sometimes when we have meetings, I tell you guys all the time, this, you know, we have a volunteer army, right? Because most of the church workers are on a voluntary basis. Because in this world, everything is turned upside down. Because the God of this age is Satan, it's, it's Lucifer. Lucifer empowers and gives money to his workers. So if you look at the world in, as a whole, how can somebody that pushes a music genre that disrespects women, disrespects authority, promotes crime, promotes decadence, promotes all that, they get paid millions, but you do a, a Christian album, you can't sell a thousand CDs. Okay, it's all backwards. But when I use the word, you know, volunteer army, did you guys know the word volunteer is not even found in the Bible? Not even found in the Bible. Why do we even associate volunteers in, in the church? Do you know what is found in the Bible? 
mentioned more than 700 times? Huh? Servers, servants. Serving and servants is found over 700 times in the Bible. And so let's, let's begin to break this down uh, tonight. And so I, I, I put this right here. If love and fear are the greatest motivators, if love and fear are the greatest motivators, which they are, that's the total opposites in the kingdom, faith and fear. Faith is our weapon. Fear is Satan's weapon. If that is the greatest motivator for you to, to, to act, which it is, which one is motivating you? Which one is motivating you? What are you doing right now? And when you analyze why are you doing it, does it come from a place of fear or does it come from a place of faith? Because there's, there's a distinction between the two, and I'm going to show you that. If you turn to Matthew 24, chapter 24, we are told here by Jesus, starting with verse 12, listen to what he says. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Everybody say this with me. Say conditional. So I'm not, this is not the sermon for it tonight, but people that say once you're saved, you're always saved. No matter how you do or how you live, you're always saved. That's not true. And I, I'm gonna, I, I've been telling you guys I want to preach a sermon on that. It's, probably, it's not going to be a Thursday because I'm going to hit them square in the middle of the eye on a Sunday morning. I'm going to get them on a Sunday morning. Um, this notion that now Jesus loves us unconditionally. There's no conditions to his love. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says he still died for us. But salvation comes with conditions. And we see that right here by, by Jesus himself. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. In other words, say this, say, there's an endurance to our Christian walk. There's an endurance. And people, listen, people today are no longer being able to endure the coldness in the, the multiplication of sin in the world. There is a lot of people, and I shared this with you guys many, many times before, there is a sifting and shifting taking place right now. As we speak, God is separating the wheat from the chaff. He's, he's making a distinction between his and between the, the devils. He's separating his church. He is purifying his church through this season of fire. Because I don't know, again, unless you're living under a rock, we're, we're in a season of testing right now. We're in a season of testing. I mentioned to you guys maybe several weeks ago where I said, Post-COVID 2020, if, you, if we're now just beginning to receive the data on church growth, and it doesn't look good. Because what happened as soon as the calamity hit, as soon as the pandemic hit, how many know that the best way to find out what type of a Christian you are is once you put in the fire? When, 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 when God puts a squeeze on you, then we'll find out what you're actually made up out of. Like, what are you made of? Are you now going to stand on, on the promises of God in spite of what you're going through? Or are you going to buckle or are you going to run? And this is what we see. So, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many would grow cold. But then he says, the one that stands firm to the end shall be saved. And here's what you will find. I want you to write this down. Here's what you'll find. What you love the most is what you will give to the most. What you love to the most is what you will give to the most. Because as the Bible says, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Now, now we heard that passage of Scripture preached a hundred times. You've been Christian for a long time. You've heard pretty much an encapsulation of what I just said. What you love the most is what you will give to the most. So here's a question for you. What moves your heart? What moves your heart? If I can kind of break it all the way down, what excites you? What stirs your emotions? What makes you jump out of bed and the first thing in your mind is like, oh, I can't wait to do X? Or, or is serving God a, a consistent thing where you're, you feel like you have to be dragged kicking and screaming to do that. Now, there's a season of that. 
There's a season of, and I call it when you, when God transforms you and you accept Jesus Christ, there's a season of developing discipline in your life, right? Discipline. Out of discipline, desire will come. And then out of desire, then delight will come. You delight in God, but delight, having this extraordinary experience with the creator God does not happen first. It first begins with the discipline. You have to discipline, kind of like going to the gym. You're not going to get muscles by looking at Twinkies all day and sitting and eating them or, in, or looking at people work out. You go to the gym, you put on your, your workout clothes, and you just sit down and you watch people work out for two hours. That's never, you're never going to get fit that way. You have to discipline yourself to do that. And over time, you begin to build faith in the, in the, you know, discipline goes to desire, desire goes to delight. Does that make sense? So what you love the most is what you will give to the most. And I also like to phrase it this way. I want to write this down right here. If you serve or you, or you can serve without loving you can't serve without loving. I've met a lot of people that serve in church, and they have no love. It's a, it's a sense of obligation. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. You cannot love without serving. Now, again, I, I told you a little bit ago, I'm not going to beat you up. But if you claim that you love God and you have served him, and you've been saved for not months, you've been saved for years, and you really say, I truly believe that this God who was perfect came 2,000 years ago, died on the cross for me and forgave me of my sins while I was jacked up. There was nothing undesirable that I had to offer him. And he did all that for me, and I love him. If that is true, and I examine your life, there's going to be some place that you are serving him to to almost not prove that love, because we're not saved by our works, and I'm going to get into that here in a little bit, not to prove by... Uh, the love that you have for them, for him, but it is a natural progression. Okay, it's a natural progression. I've, I give, I've given you guys this example before. I cannot say I love my wife if I don't talk to her, if I don't spend time with her, if I'm not in the same room with her, if I don't give her gifts. Right? Why? Because love, true love, will sacrifice. I will do those things because I love her. Amen? That's super easy to understand. Even the heathen understands that, right? Super easy to understand. And so we are not saved by works, but we are saved to work. I want you to write that down. We are not saved by works, but we are saved for work, to work, okay? Every one of you here has been given life by the creator God for a specific purpose. And the, the, the thing that bugs me the most is when people come to me and when we're talking about serving at any capacity, what I normally hear, well, well, pastor, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. Okay, well, I, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a, you know, they, they normally default to the fivefold ministry. There is something that you can do that God wired you and created you to do, something specific that you can do. And if you do it, with excellence, this is, let me, let me backtrack just a little bit. I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of know why it is because the human construct society has built it in a such, such a way where we, we tend to put value on the things that are exposed, like things that are in the, in the, in the front, you know, a guy grabbing the mic, you know, a president of a company, a CEO, we never tend to give credit to the guy that's cleaning the toilets. But li- listen to me. God will not look at you as someone important by your exposure. He's not going to grade you according to what title he has given you because he is the giver of gifts. The Bible says when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Every one of us was born with a gift. He will judge you according to how you managed in that gift. What did you do in the kingdom that that deposit that I made in you, that, listen, God is a good investor. He's not going to put a deposit in you, listen, 
without expecting a return on his investment. I'm going to show that to you in, in Scripture. I don't have time to get into the, the parable of the talents. One was given one, one was given two, the other one was given five. The one that was given one was scared and buried it out of fear. His motivation was, I'm not going to step into my gift because I might be rejected. Whatever the reason was, he buried it. And when the Lord, the master, came settling accounts, he called that servant wicked. And you know what else he called them? You wicked and lazy servant. Even the heathen would have known to invest that money in the bank. At least he would have earned interest. So God, look to your neighbor and says, God is going to settle my account. Galatians 5.13, listen to what he says. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But watch this. But through love, what, what's the word? But through love, what? Serve one another. But through love, serve one another. Our freedom that we find at the cross is designed to propel us to serve. That's what it's designed to do. God is not pleased with a lazy servant, a lazy son. Now, let me just jump here because some of you might be thinking that. What does that mean, Pastor? If I'm not serving in the body, am I not saved? That's not the case. That's not the case. I was sharing this with, with Jason before service. And to, to, there's, there's some passage of scripture where it says that some of us will barely make it to the kingdom. By the skin of your teeth, some of us are, will be that close. And other people I talk to, they're like, they're so desperate, you know, as long as I make it in, I don't care what happens. I, I used to think like that. I used to be like, Lord, as long as I, I don't care, I'll be a water boy in heaven. I don't care as long as I make it. But I want you to think about something. This is what I was sharing with, with Jason. Everything that you do here in this short vapor of a life, if God is good, he'll give you 70 years. If God is really favorable towards you, he'll give you 80 years, what the Bible says. My mama must have been real good. She got 86 years so far. She's still living. Life is a vapor. Those 70, 80 years that we focus so much on earthly stuff, not understanding that when we go back to dust, everything that you do for God here will ripple in eternity. Now listen, whatever and however you do for God here will dictate what you do for him in the life to come. It'll dictate what you will do for him in the life to come. Some of us are not going to be too happy when we cross over. We're going to be happy we made it to heaven, but you'll be looking around and saying, oh my God, why? If I'd have just obeyed what he called me to do. And think about this, what he's going to give to us as far as rewards, that's going to be a reward that will play out for the rest of eternity. And in a, in a world that is incorruptible, Think about that for a second. How much effort do we put on, the, on this earth suit and the things of this earth that last but just a few years and is gone, is going to be destroyed? When we die, nothing that we do here we can take with us. We're not going to be able to take our bank accounts. We're not going to be able to take our video games, our PhDs on the wall, our accomplishments, nothing. The only thing we could take with us is what we did for Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ that we live in, the gifts that he deposited in us, and how we use those gifts to expand the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to show this, these things to you in Scripture more here. So, um, Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
Do you know how many people, and they, man, every excuse is so, so elaborate. They're so elaborate. They're so, I mean, sometimes I think like, man, how, how long did you take to come up with that one? We will create all kinds of excuse to justify us not doing what God has called us to do, not playing our part. Now, some business, not, this is not a blanket statement. Some individuals are called to finance the kingdom. They're involved in business. They have a relationship with God. They have overseers. They have pastors, but they're enthralled in business. What I hate to see is people that are believers, and, and I've heard this before, pastor, you know, you might not see me for a while because I'm trying to pay off my mortgage. There's some things I want to do with my finance. You might not see me for a while. I know that as the beginning, and this is what I've seen. I've never seen that play out where they do everything according to their plan, and they come back better. It never works that way. Hear me. Never. Every single time they say that, something along the line breaks down. Why? Because they took the eyes of what the Scripture says. Seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God. Everything else I'll add to you. And as a pastor, speaking freely, again, I'm kicking my shoes off today. I'm just having a conversation with you guys. As a pastor, sometimes I get frustrated, man. Very frustrated with people because I'm like, how many times are we going to go through this? You've been chasing that mouse wheel for 10 years. One, one of the things that gets me the most is people that, well, let me not say that one. <laughs> I want to keep it upbeat tonight. <laughs> There's so many things that we do that when we violate Scripture, and it blows up in my, on our face. We go running to, to, to God to complain about it. And the Bible is very clear. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's been a while since I've said this to you guys. I train my daughters. If you get a job anywhere, you don't work on Sundays. That's a deal breaker. I don't care if they, they're offering you six figures. You don't work on Sunday. Why? Part of the Ten Commandments. Okay? You shall keep the Sabbath holy. Somebody may say, well, pastor, we're missing it because Sabbath is Saturday. Saturday, Sunday, doesn't matter. You, God was saying, you're going to reserve one day for me. Because he worked six days, and on the seventh, he rested. And as a sign of acknowledgement of what he does for us, in him, we move, we breathe, we have our being. He's the one that gives us energy to wake up every morning. He's the one that causes the sun to shine on us, the rain to fall on us, the fruits to, you know, the harvest to produce, all these things. He deserves our devotion. And so this is, this is part of a discipline thing. But this is what, what's, what's, what we're seeing here. And this week, um, how many, I don't know if you guys seen the, um, the uh, movie came out on Netflix um, called Don't Look Up. Okay, how many, some of you guys may have seen that movie, right? Don't Look Up. Part of my frustration again, because when I watch this stuff, I'm like, knowing, knowing that I'm an eschatology guy, I know the Bible, there are things that these guys will put in front of your faces that they know is coming, and they entertain you with it. They entertain you with it. Just this week, this is a side note, just this week on TikTok, I came across this Simpsons. How many have heard the conspiracy theory with the Simpsons, Simpsons uh, where they predict the future. There's a whole lot of episodes. How many have heard that? Okay. I mean, it's freakishly accurate. Freakishly accurate. And I heard a thing from the Simpsons where they were literally, it was the rapture that took place. Have you all seen that? It was a rapture that took place, and it showed different characters. First, it was a guy in a taxi cab that he was cheating on his wife. And the rapture took place, and he, he started freaking out. Another one was a homosexual. He said, I should have never lived a gay lifestyle. And he was left behind. And I'm like, I'm watching this, and I'm like, these guys, this is a secular cartoon, and these, they're preaching scripture that most Christians don't even know exist. They were left behind. But going back to... Um, Going back to don't look up, how many have heard the 
comet that they named Apophis. Anybody here? Apophis. A few years back, NASA discovered it. This, uh, Discovery Channel, I think it was two or three years ago, did a piece on it. And initially when they came out with Apophis, they said that the, this common Apophis, the size of, it was, it was massive. I think it was, I, don't, I can't remember if it was two or three football fields long. Um, it's pretty big. You say, you might say, well, that's not that big enough. An asteroid coming at that speed, hitting the earth, um, a bullet is not that big compared to a, a watermelon, but, a, but a, a, a nice bullet will make a watermelon explode. That's the concept. And Apophis, initially, they said that it was going to hit in 2029, initially. And then NASA started changing it. But it was a guy by the name of Tom Horn. I've, I've listened to him. This guy uh, teaches on eschatology. He writes books. He predicted a lot of things that have come to pass. He's kind of like a modern-day prophet. So if you go home tonight, you want to write that down, Tom Horn. But if you go home and you Google that name, you will see a testimony of this guy saying he had a vision from God, a vision, that in the year 2029, April 13th, which is a Friday the 13th on 2029, he had a vision of this uh, comet hitting the earth. And he said the devastation was in the hundreds of millions of people. Now, I want you to think about that just for a second. For those that watch the, the movie, don't look up. I thought to myself, for years before COVID, I thought to myself, Father, what will wake these people up to actually compel them to take kingdom seriously? How much? And I, was, I would talk to Pastor Dave, and I was like, maybe it'll take an emergency. Maybe it'll take something crazy to prove to the people that their God is close at hand. And maybe by allowing these things to happen, just like maybe 9-11, if you guys remember 9-11, when it happened, everybody got together. And that weekend, the churches were filled, packed out. People were getting saved. And then I started asking, Lord, what will it take? After 9-11, a few months later, things started going back to normal. People started leaving the church. And then I'm, I'm like, we seen COVID 2019, 2020. This year, it's, been t it's taken a whole lot of lives. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're hearing about this new beast system, COVID passport, the mark of the beast. We're seeing signs in the heavens. We're seeing comets. We're having thousand-year floods, thousand-year famines. Like, there are signs everywhere, everywhere. And I'm asking God, Father, when will they believe? Not, not only when will they see it, they're seeing it now, but when will they believe? When will the pews begin to fill up? When will these things happen? Going back to Apophis 2029, what would you do today when this service ended and you went home and you knew that 2020 or April 13th of 2029 was going to be the last day you had on earth, what would you do? How would you live? How would you prioritize your day? Knowing, knowing that when you stand before the judgment throne of God, the only thing that will last is what you did for him. Question, would you live the exact same way? Or would, would there be drastic changes in your life? And it was, that movie was crazy because I'm like, the only reason why I watched it, and I don't promote movies like that, the only reason why I watched it, because I know Hollywood is filled with satanic things that they do, and they literally, I don't know what it is, it's almost like the devil tells God, your creation is so stinking stupid that we will entertain them with their own demise, and they will eat it up. Well, pastor, is that, is that in the Bible? What? Comet hitting the earth? Yes. Revelation, it talks about a mountain, wormwood, size of something the size of a mountain being cast into the sea, and mile-high waves destroying the, the, the earth. 
Okay, that's just beginning of the, uh, of the pains. Like that's, I believe that's part of the seven-year tribulation. But here's another kicker for you. If that is Wormwood, if that is Wormwood, 2029, if everything this, this guy, Tom Horn, and you read his, or you see his testimony, you hear his testimony, it's scary, man. If that is Wormwood, talked about in Revelation, we will not be here as a church. Okay? The rapture of, of the bride of Christ will happen before then. Because Wormwood is approximately middle of the tribulation. And then the scientists say, if it misses us, this is not what the prophet said, because the prophet said it's going to hit. But the scientist says, if it hits us, it'll be back seven years later, 2036, it will hit. So whether we escape it in 2029 or 2020 or 2036, one of those is going to hit. God will judge every deed that is done in the body. He'll judge it. John 5, 21 and 23, listen to what it says. For as the Father, I love this passage of Scripture. Some of you guys never even knew this was in here. Watch. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one. Okay? And I mentioned that weeks back. The Heavenly Father will not judge anybody. Who will judge? Continue. But he has given all judgment to the son. Pause for, for one second. Get this. The one that is able to save you is the very one that you need saved from. He knows that when a standard is broken, when sin is committed, there is only one way to satisfy that perfect standard. So Christ himself came in human flesh and said, I made a way of escape. I, I, I solved the problem you created in the garden. It is a gift that I give to you. Why? I love you so much because I know judgment is coming. Every sin, every act of disobedience must be dealt with. But I lived a perfect, sinless life so that you can accept me. And once you accept me, my righteousness becomes yours. The one that will judge you is the one that you need saved from. So we honor the Father by honoring the Son, and we honor the Son by serving each other. We honor the Son by serving each other. I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to be a preacher. I'm not saying you need to be in church, you know, 24-7 and need to be, like, doing everything. I'm saying do your part. If you don't know your part, ask God, Lord, what is my part? And most of the time, your part is something that you see in church that bugs the snot out of you, that you complain about all the time. Like, man, why is it blah, blah, blah? If God showed it to you, he's probably wanting to use you to make that department better. Amen? Because we need workers, man. We need workers. 2 Corinthians 5.10, listen to what it says. For we must all appear, say all. It, it, forget this notion that once you're saved and, you know, you've been inoculated so-called from sin and hell, okay, which is not a thing, but forget this thing that once you're saved, you get into heaven and there's nothing else. There is a judgment for saved people. We will stand before God's judgment throne, and I'm going to show this to you in Scripture. God will judge us for what we have done here on earth. Listen, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for him, what he has done in the body. Everybody say, in the body. Watch. Whether good or evil. Thank God for grace. Because when it says evil, we're going to be judged for the evil too. Well, pastor, I thought God forgot. He cast my sins into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west. True, when it comes to your salvation, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But every deed that we've done in the body, God's going to judge. This week, I saw a testimony. This one was, I think, a newer testimony of a guy that had died. It was a young, white teenager. He didn't look like a teenager, maybe a young adult, maybe early 20s. 
he goes on explaining how he was kind of like teeter-tottering. He, he didn't commit his life to Christ. He knew there was a creator, but he never confessed him as Savior. And he dies. Kind of a long story, but I want to give you just the gist of it. He says when he, he ascends on to heaven, he goes through, like, different levels. He's describing going through the firmament, which I thought was interesting. Here's a guy that didn't know scripture. He was describing these demons that were on earth that was calling out to him to not go. He's, he witnessed pockets. This is how he, he described it. He said he, when he looked at the earth, there were, it was darkness that covered the earth, but there were pockets of light. And sometimes the light exploded. And when it exploded, he would see legions and armies of demonic uh, uh, angels, demons, that would flood to that area where it exploded. And so when they were interviewing him, they asked, what do you think that is? His response, it appeared to me like movements that were happening, movements of God that was happening. And, and the, as light began to expand, these things like almost pheromones to, to bees, these things would go and try to attack it to keep from expanding, to keep that light from expanding. It's a guy that was not saved, not a Christian, didn't grow up in church. He describes, he goes to heaven, and he says he goes to the throne room, and he says where Christ was seated, he says it was so bright, and it's interesting what he said. He said, <laughs> he, said he was sitting on the throne drinking, it looked like, appeared like a cup of coffee. He had a mug. And he was just drinking. He said when he put it up to his head, you couldn't see nothing but light. And you just see the, the kind of like the silhouette of, of his hands in the mug that he was drinking. Um, somebody said Jesus loves coffee because he was a Hebrew. Hebrew. <laughs> but this is what he said. He said when he sat there, he said there was three massive screens. And then he said, as he, as he sat there, he said, I looked at that person that I knew was the creator. He says, this is how blinded I was. Here I am standing in the middle of this palace with the creator God sitting there that I didn't know who really he was. I knew he was the creator. And I knew these were angels. I, I seen the demons. And I thought to myself, if you were all loving, why did you let all that suffering happen on earth? And then he said three screens came, and there were uh, witnesses. Everything he described was biblical. And that's why when I hear a testimony, I measure that testimony. Is that biblical? Is it scriptural? And this guy nailed everything he said was biblical. He says there was a cloud of witness, and it was like stands that went up. And he's like, as far as you can see, on, on both sides, there were stands, and, and it was just people filled. Like the whole room was filled. And these three screens, all of a sudden, he saw his whole life being played out in public. He was being judged. Where did I leave you off at 2 Corinthians? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, here's another note. I want you to write this down. Flesh is earthly centered. The soul is self-centered. And the spirit is God-centered. The flesh is earth-centered. The soul is self-centered. The spirit is God-centered. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why your flesh does not go to heaven. Okay? Explain this real briefly. The Bible says that no flesh can see God and live. Your flesh is a fallen nature. It is corruptible. It's, it's I just, just this week, I was talking to Heather, and I seen this revelation I had never seen before. It made a lot of sense to me. Your flesh can never and will never be saved here on earth. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? When you say, I accept Jesus Christ, your regenerated soul, regenerated spirit, but your flesh is carnal. That is why Apostle Paul said, every single day, I crucify my what? My flesh. 
There is a war between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit that are contrary to one another. That's what the scripture says. Okay, if you don't believe that, think about the last time your flesh tried to do to get you to do something and you knew it was wrong. We go through that every single week. Some of us every single day, some of us every single hour, many of us every single minute. Constant warring between trying to secure your, your flesh being ruled by your spirit and not the other way around. And that's why the Bible says, Jesus said, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is why the flesh needs to be glorified. I don't have time to get into it, but according to the scriptures, there's a glorification process of your flesh. Because your flesh in the condition that it is, if it stood before God, the creator, man, you'll probably be burnt to a crisp because you're sinful, you're evil. So when you die, that is why your flesh stays behind and your soul, your spirit goes. Otherwise, your body would disappear too when we die. You know, somebody dropped dead right here. If I dropped dead, I would just fizzle away and you wouldn't see me no more. It's like, oh, I guess he's gone. That's not the case. There is going to come a moment where God's going to glorify our bodies. Every grave will give up its dead. The sea will give up its dead. We will be judged. And in the process, God will glorify our bodies. Now, what will we be judged for? I just told you everything. We will be judged for everything that we've done in the body. Now, there is a book that Malachi describes. Malachi describes in Malachi chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, he calls it a book of remembrance. God is keeping records. Maybe that's what they got Santa Claus from. He's keeping records of how you're living, what you're doing. Listen, verse 15. And now we call the arrogant, blessed, evildoers. Now, I'm going to explain to you what this passage here means because it kind of leads into the verse I want to emphasize. It says, and now we call the arrogant, blessed, evildoers not only not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Pause right there. So Malachi, uh, David, I think, addresses this. I think it's in Proverbs or Psalms where he says, why does the evildoer prosper? Why does the wicked prosper? That question, how many have had that question or somebody posed that question to you? Okay. Is it worth being a Christian, man? I've been doing this stuff forever. Why is it that I see a friend of mine that is just dirty? He's, he's, he's wicked. He's sinful. He doesn't acknowledge God, but everything he does prospers. Everything he touches turns into gold. That's been a philosophical question, a universal, universal question that's been asked for years. And so Malachi here is actually saying that. He's, they're having a conversation. The scripture doesn't say with who, but they're having a conversation, and he's complaining. He's you know, and now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. In other words, there's no judgment, God. They're cursing your name. They're doing all these things and there's no judgment. Watch what verse 16 said. Then those who fear the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them in a, say with me, a book of remembrance. Okay, that's the record book. There's a record hall in heaven. Book of Remembrance was written before him and those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. How do we esteem? Watch. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession in the day of judgment. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. There's the word again, serve, okay, who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God. Everybody say serve. The one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Here's how we should end our day. Every time you lay your head in the pillow at night, 
ask God this question. Hey, Daddy, what did you put in the book of remembrance regarding my life today? What did you record? Is it blank? Did I do anything for you, God? So when, see, when we're talking about serving, we're not just talking about serving in your community, in your body. We're talking about serving at your workplace, serving at the gas pump, serving at Walmart. When was the last time you opened your mouth to speak life and a blessing over anyone? I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm saying that there's a record book in heaven Everything that we do will be tried by fire, and we will, listen, we will get our due reward, our recompense. So I went from being, a, you know, wanting just to, as long as I make it as the water boy, to like, listen, if I'm going to endure this hell here on earth, am I, if I'm going to fight some demons, if I'm going to have some countless sleepless nights, if I'm going to pray and intercede and groan that you know, make sounds that words cannot even utter. If I'm going to go through all that, David put it this way. When they were sitting around looking at the giant, Goliath defying the armies of God, he looked at him and says, is there not a cause? When he asked the question, what will be done for the guy that kills this bozo right here? And then he heard, half of the kingdom's wealth will be yours and you're going to marry the king's daughter. His response is there not a cause? What y'all sitting around here for, man? There's a reward on this thing? I get to, to do what God has created me to do and get paid for it? You know what I'm saying? This is the mindset, guys. And, I, and I'm telling you, when that day comes, because it's going to come for all of us, last I checked, the death rate is still 100%. There's no one that escapes it. When it comes, you're going to be able to die with a smile. And you will be able to say what the Apostle Paul said, I fought the good faith. I kept my eyes on the prize. Now to me is laid up a crown of righteousness. Paul knew, man. Everything he abandoned. Another passage of Scripture, Paul said, everything that I have lost in this life, all the luxuries, all the big cars, all the good jobs, everything that I have lost for the sake of Christ, I count it as crap, as dung. That's the value he put on it. Because he knew for the things that are to come, the glory that is to come, all this earthly stuff, are you kidding me? I'll give it up 10,000 times over. So this is foundational. I'm just closing. This is foundational to our lives, not only here, but to our lives that is to come. You know, I know for many of us, we sometimes hear of heavenly rewards, and part of us is just like, if you're honest with yourself, you're like, ah, oh, heavenly, I'm tired of hitting, hearing heavenly. Can I get my reward now? Like I said a few weeks ago, it's my money. I want it now. There's not this notion that we're just going to get rewarded in heaven. We're going to get rewarded here, too. Because when God gives you prosperity, whether it comes to physical prosperity, health, wealth, the scripture says when he gives it to you, he adds no sorrow to it. When the enemy gives it to you, man, there's a lot of sorrows. Think about it. Think about the sham of the so-called rich lifestyle, successful lifestyle. Think about how much that is a sham. Why do I say that? Do you know how many millionaires have to pop happy pills to go to sleep at night? Do you know how many billionaires have put a shotgun to their head and blow their brains out? How many celebrities that literally can get anything they want, buy anything, have anything in what they want in life? They have the best of everything. But every night when they go to sleep, there's a big God-shaped hole that they can never fill. They can't fill it with women. They can't fill it with drugs. They can't fill it with money. They can't fill it with notoriety, nothing. 1 Corinthians 3, 12, 15. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation, everybody say foundation, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, 
each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it, that day of judgment. Now, this is all scripture right here, y'all. This is what he's saying. Each one's work will become manifest for that day will disclose it, that day of judgment, because it will be revealed by fire. God will test every work and the fire will be will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Not only is what you do for God important, is the motive by which you do it is important. I don't have time to get into that. But understand, there's a book of remembrance. There's a record in heaven being built up. Nothing that you do for Christ here will not follow you into eternity. Every penny earned since you have become a son of God, a daughter of God, God will give an account. Would hay, stubble, will be burned up. Think about wood, hay, and stubble. All those things are found above ground. It's got a sense of a large, you know, you can look at hay. It has a, apparently, like, looks big, but it has no density. That's the word. Who said that? Who was it? Help me preach, brother. Oh, Scott, I was thinking about you today, man. Good to see you. No density, but the silver, gold, and precious stone found on the ground. It's found on the ground. It's hidden, valuable. And the cool thing about gold is when you burn it up, you don't lose not even one, one tiny bit of it. You may melt it. You may crush it. You may put it through a shredder. You may do whatever, but it stays in, in its wholeness, right? You don't lose anything. I don't want to lose anything I do for God here. I don't want to lose anything. I'm always asking God, Lord, examine my motives, examine my heart. I want to make sure that what I'm doing, when the day of judgment comes, it'll last. I don't want to take with me a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble. Amen? And then 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'll give you two more scriptures and we'll close. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, listen. This is what Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. On that what day? On that day of judgment. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In the closing scripture, Ephesians 4.16. Ephesians 4.16. This is, if going into 2016, if everyone here and everyone streaming, there are people that, because of COVID, have kind of sat back at home, but everything has gotten better. The job, they go to job, they go to the work, they go to grocery store, they, but they just haven't found themselves back in the corporate body. You need to come back. You need to return. Because listen, the time is drawn to a close, and we have a lot of work to do. It's going to take all hands on deck. And if we come together and everyone does their part, this is what the Bible says, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work as each part does its work. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. And for some of us here, we've just been jacked up in ministry. We've seen a bunch of clowns. We've been abused, mistreated, and all kinds of stuff. You need to shake all that junk off. You need to hit that reset button. You need to say, Lord, I'm not going to get people, your people confused with who you are. I'm still alive. There's still a gift in me. You still created me to do something I was saved to serve, 
and I want to do it. I want to do, I find me working. Occupy until I come, right? We can't occupy sitting on our blessed assurance. Amen? Amen? Can, if you believe that, shout amen. Stand with me. Hallelujah. So, in the weeks to come, in the weeks to come, we're going to be doing um, some volunteer sermons on volunteering, on being a servant. I don't like using the word volunteer now since I know it's not in the Bible. Being a servant, being a son, we're not here to create slaves. Again, we're not saved by our deeds we're not saved by our works but we're saved to work so for those that will, will you know kind of put your hands to the plow in 2022 make sure you're constantly reminded yourself you're not accepted by for what you do for God you're accepted for what he did for you on the cross okay we don't we don't we don't do from him for him you know in a place where we do for him for, be, for us to be saved we're saved from the place of done He's already done it. But because he's done it, we get to a place where we give back by, by putting our hands to the plow and working and, and fulfilling what God has called us to do. You're not called to sit and warm up a seat. Amen? Know that. You know, re, recite that. Be, be soberly aware of that reality. So bow your heads with me. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you. God, there was, Father, three places where you cried, where you wept, found in Scripture. One was when you brought Lazarus back to life after you had saw his body dead, the consequences of sin. The other was when you were in the Garden of Gethsemane, awaiting, Father God, the judgment of all sin to be cast upon your shoulders. Father, the other one was when you looked at Jerusalem and you wept bitterly, Father. And God, you said, oh, how I wish to gather you like a, a hen gathers her chicks, but you are left without a shepherd. You're left without a, anybody that, was, that would be willing to lay down his life to provide for you, to care for you, to nurture you. Because a good shepherd lays down his life for the flock. He sacrifices himself in servitude of what God cherishes and what he loves. Father, I know it can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. If I look at the task that we are to accomplish ahead, Father, in 2022, it can be overwhelming. Because I know how much work needs to be done and I know it's going to take all hands on deck and Father I pray right now pray for the Lord of the harvest don't, play, don't pray for the harvest because the harvest is plentiful but pray for the laborers God pray for the workers Lord is what you said so God I pray right now for the workers I ask that you send them God from the east to the west and the north to the south people, Lord, that, that have been baptized, God, with a burden. Men and women who understand, God, the great love that you had for them. That you bankrupted heaven, Father, for them. Died gruesome death. Place to open shame to save them, God. And out of that revelation out of that reality out of that conviction out of believing truly believing that father they have chosen to lay down their life for their brother and sister and so i just ask that you send them and those that are already here god they're already present that have been sitting on the sidelines god 
I ask that you move upon their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray that they put their hands to the plow. That, Lord, anytime there's anything that needs done in this church, in this church community, that anytime we make an announcement, God, we have, a, a, we have to turn people away. We have a list, long list, where we have to turn people away, God. Let that be said about the Rock Columbus, where we loved you so much, God, and we loved you so deeply that we honored you, Father, by honoring each other in servitude to one another. Bless this church, Father. Bless this church. God, guys, we don't know. You said you would come like a thief in the night, God. We don't know when that time is, but God, find us prepared to face you in the great day of judgment. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Well, you enjoy the message? Is that all right? Amen. Sunday, 10 a.m. sharp. Make sure you get here a little bit earlier. Have some coffee, break some bread together, laugh. Amen. Let's start working on building this community. Love on somebody on your way out. We'll see you guys Sunday at 10 a.m. sharp. Be prepared for a mighty message.